Welcome everyone um, to our next event in the Let's Talk News Business series that we are, like all events happening right now, doing online. I'm super excited um, to welcome Shazna Nessa uh, here with us in this conversation. Um, Shazna is uh, one of the most renowned product and digital strategy and digital journalism thinkers and doers I know and also a dear friend so I'm very excited uh, that we can have Shazna here uh, with us today. Uh, Shazna is the um, global head of visuals uh, at the Wall Street Journal and she has a very uh, exciting and long career uh, that before that brought her to the Knight Foundation to philanthropy where she was the director of journalism um, she was at AP as head of product and before that in product roles at Condé Nast. Um, and uh, now Shazna is also an ONA uh, board president. So Shazna, welcome and thanks for being here with us. Thank you. And also welcome to my uh, home in Harlem. Very nice to have you here. <laughs> yeah, that's, we get to see quite a lot of homes uh, these days. Um, that's, that's the, well, you could say the, that's the, the nice part about the corona. Uh, the coronavirus. So Shazna, we, uh, when we decided um, on our topic for today, um, we said that we would uh, talk about the business case for visual journalism. The whole series that we are doing is really um, geared towards, um, you know, tackling the difficult business issues that we are facing and talking about how to rethink the business side. But very often the business side is very much connected to the editorial side, to the product side, to the marketing side of things. So this is what we're gonna look at today. Uh, I'd encourage all the participants, um, feel free to um, send in your questions via the Q&A tool, ideally. Uh, we're gonna answer questions throughout the conversation. Shazna and I are gonna do a bit back and forth in the beginning, but please feel free to already start um, posting questions in the uh, Q&A tool that Shazna is gonna uh, answer uh, when we get to the Q&A part. Um, so Shazna, let me maybe start with, with one question that's kind of a little bit of a um, devil's advocate question, if you if you'd like. Um, obviously, one could say, well, come on, we have Corona, uh, we have uh, police brutality and racism that we deal with, um, we have a large business crisis looming, is it really that important um, to talk about storytelling and visual journalism? Mm. What would you say um, to that? I would say absolutely yes. Um, I would say that that's, it's a bit like saying, should we talk about journalism, period. And in a moment like this, we've already seen through um, interest from readers and members and audiences everywhere that there is a voracious appetite for the facts and for evidence. And um, I think there is a very great, you know, there's a very uh, obvious connection between visual journalism and the presentation and the, uh, you know, delivering uh, stories in a way that uh, a lot of people want to digest and understand stories right now is through, obviously, data. Every story, there are data angles and there are people angles. And both of these angles can be very, very powerfully told through storytelling that perhaps isn't in sort of a classic um, long form text narrative, even, you know, even though there is a place for that type of journalism as well, of course. So what I saw in quite a lot of traditional newsrooms is that storytelling, so everything that's visual, everything that's multimedia, everything that's data is sometimes still seen as kind of just a sprinkle on the cake. So you basically mm. finish your research, you finish your stories, um, and then in the, at the end, someone, you know, makes a pretty uh, infographic or a nice picture right. out of it. Um, is that know, something that you encountered? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I've been in this game a long time. I, I, um, I, started, uh, I started in the field in 99, in, in the journalism field, in visual journalism. And I left for a while and I came back. And it was really shocking to me when I came back. But I, I hadn't seen a giant leap that things were still things are still a little marginal when it came to telling stories in different, in different ways. Um, but I do think it's getting better. I do think there's enough, we have more and more data now, we can show evidence, look, this is what 
um, this is what resonates with people. And look, the, the way people read news and buy news and experience news should come in all different formats. Um, I think technology has also changed that a great deal. Our small screens, our phones, mobile obviously is a increasingly growing in, in how people get information, news and information, and um, telling stories in very small amounts of space uh, can be done very, very efficiently with, uh, with different visual formats, whether it's video, whether it's um, graphics, data visualizations, photography, and a blend of all of the above inter interlacing text with it. I think we really have to tell stories in the way they are told best, and that's how you're gonna resonate with your audience. When you think about some of the organizations you worked in, I think it's fair to say, although both AP and Wall Street Journal are very innovative organizations, they are also relatively, in their history, relatively text-centric. So I assume that a lot of your role also involves uh, change management and, and driving the transformation in a broader sense than just visual. Yeah, right? absolutely. I, I sometimes... Uh sometimes wince. Um, I feel like I've uh, been in this change management role for forever. And, but it's actually very powerful. It's very, it's very, um, it's very powerful because actually when I was at the, when I was at the AP, I was, uh, I was sent to a program which was formerly called the Salzburger program, now called the Media Transformation Challenge, which is a little bit of a drier term, of course. Um, but at that point, I, I was a visual journalist. I really considered myself an artist, a creative person. I didn't want to care about the, the business side of things. It was boring. It was corporate. And uh, it was a real eye-opener to me to uh, be able to connect what I did to the, the rest of the world, to, my, to our audiences, to the business. And since then, it's been a very powerful driving force for me to, to see the whole picture and to be able to um, influence the picture and to help the whole picture. Um, but change management is, is, is a slow game. It's, to do it properly, I think you really have to go deep. You have to go really, really deep and have to just keep repeating things again and again and again. And it's been over 20 years and I'm still repeating the same thing. But I do see progress. I do see amazing progress. And I see um, obviously big organizations like the Journal and uh, the New York Times and the Post, and, but also great local news organizations. Um, you know, I'm very involved with ONA and I'm seeing lots of fantastic uh, data driven journalism and database, data, public facing databases that help people like search for their own, uh, you know, information around schools or around police, policing and uh, be able to sort of translate those experiences to their own individual needs. So I do think things have changed, but um, change management is, it, <laughs> it takes a really long time and to some degree, you know, you can do a lot of grassroots things and try and change things from, from the ground up. But often in big corporations and big organizations, you really absolutely need to convince everybody around you, but also everybody above you, because it's very hard to progress without that. Um, and yeah, visuals, you know, visuals have always a little bit been the underdog, you know, I've, I've heard the work of very um, talented visual journalists being described as bells and whistles or furniture or even art, which sometimes I take umbrage with because journalism is an art. Um, so yeah, it's an, ongoing, it's an ongoing game. Do you feel that there is a certain danger that, um, you know, as part of the current, the, the crisis and the furloughs and the layoffs, um, that some organizations, you know, that there might be a backlash to, oh, this is all, you know, this is too touchy-feely and we, you know, need to get back to basics? Um, but it's not touchy feely. If you're showing, if you're showing a very powerful data visualization that's tracking, that's showing how people are spreading a, a deadly infection, you know, that is not touchy feely. That is giving people very clear uh, information and, and told in a very straightforward way. So this idea that it's touchy feely, well, first the idea that Maybe you didn't mean that about visual journalism. The idea that visual journalism is touchy-feely is ridiculous. But the idea that culture change in the process of change management is just about being a decent person. Well, no, it's actually a lot more than that. It's, it's also about um, 
learning to learn, to always be learning. It's about being prepared to be able to adapt to any situation. Um, and frankly, in journalism, it's so much about understanding our audience in a much more nuanced and profound way. And I think some of the, some of the things we're seeing now, some of, the, um, some, of, some of what COVID, frankly, has also accelerated, um, has shown us how important it is to get closer to our communities, to really listen to our audiences, to understand where they are, what they're doing, when they need what type of information, and to be able to get that to them. Um, you know, as part of my work at the Online News Association, we put out a survey uh, pretty early on around what was on people's minds, what was on the minds of our community, our, our members, um, our staff, and people who are sort of friends of ONA. And we got an overwhelming response. And uh, we sort of outlined a lot of that in uh, President's newsletter that we, we put out recently. And um, there's a real hunger right now to leapfrog that aforementioned slowness, that latency to change, and just to hurry up and get things done. I think COVID has really shown us that we don't have time to waste. Um, so things like, you know, engaging communities, uh, not just our communities, but our communities in our workplace. Who are we hiring? Who are, who are we promoting? Um, who are we developing? What type of people are we um, supporting? You know, we need to, be aware of the diversity, the direct diversity needs of newsrooms as well. Um, so th there's a there's a real hunger and appetite right now within newsrooms just to leapfrog all that crap and just get to it. And I, I mean I'm I'm completely uh, as you as you know on 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 your side with that. I hope that um, that this current shift um, will allow us to actually tackle some things that we knew we should have tackled a long time ago as newsrooms, but we kind of pushed them off. And that's both on the innovation and transformation side and prioritizing digital businesses as well as on the diversity side. The one thing that worries me is that I, I, I hear that, you, that you're seeing that in a lot of the, the ONA uh, members, but I, I assume that's al already a little bit of a selection bias because they are somehow on the more digital and innovative side of things, maybe. What I do see in some newsrooms and in some conversations I have is uh, something that worries me, where basically I feel that the people that are laid off and are furloughed are sometimes the ones that have been carrying a lot of the change maker weight on their shoulders and have been doing a lot of the transformation and innovation work in organizations. Um, and maybe it's just, you know, um, a spotlight that I see, but I do feel that we have a generation of mid entry, not, not entry level, but like mid level people in their first leadership roles that carry a lot of the weight um, and get, you know, a lot of the pressure in this transformation. Is that something that at all, you know, resonates with you or that you see in your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit, um what I mentioned sort of, it sort of connects to what I said earlier about how certain types of journalism, certain functions are marginal. They're not seen as essential. And I would say that unfortunately, we are going to have to look at supporting some of the journalists, these very innovative journalists who have lost their jobs and help them, help them uh, transition into different roles in other types of organizations and maybe hopefully one day they'll they'll come back or they will take the message of journalism to whatever other organizations they work in but this is all part of this is all part of that frustration and that sort of change management um of mentality that we need to we need to attack much more voraciously i mean i will say that you know i've been at the journal three years now and um what I've experienced in the last few months has been extraordinary. I think this whole thing of everybody working from home, um, the urgency of the situation has meant that we're just doing it. I think there is there's less sort of clutter. There's less um, there's less sort of layers of bureaucracy. People are just doing it. They're doing the things that we should have been doing. And now the question is, can we? How do we carry that on? How do we move that forward um, and hold on to that and make it better and continue with that? So I do think there are opportunities in some newsrooms 
Um, but you're right too that there there are layoffs, and and I think that's also it's also really part of what I was saying earlier. Like I think everybody needs to have a bit of a general manager. Every journalist needs to be a little bit a general manager as well, and connect things to the business. Um, I remember when I first got my my first big job and I inherited a, a really big team and it was in 2000, you know, 2007, 2008. And it was a terrible time in American newsrooms because people were being laid off. There were cuts everywhere. You have to be in a position to be able to say why what you do matters, why it's connected to the bottom line, why it's essential to the core. So I think this whole, um, this business of series is fantastic because, you know, it's really highlighting that people in the newsroom who are journalists also have to wear a few different hats. Um, and I found myself really trying to figure out how do I make sure that the fewest people on my team get laid off in this moment. And I think that's a muscle we all need to build in order to like protect some of these really great and important things that we want to do in journalism. Um, so. Let's stay with the. I, the, I, the I also, can I just, one more thing. I, I like to find people a little bit unimaginative with, with visual journalism. Um, when I worked at the AP um, and, and the business piece of it, when I worked at the AP, AP is actually fantastic with its photography. Like we ha like AP has like gold star photography, incredible photography, obviously video as well. But when it came to things that were a bit more dynamic in terms of digital experiences, um, they were a little bit stuck on how to turn that into a business. And uh, that was something I pushed really hard uh, on. And I think we can be a lot more imaginative than we are right now because we're so stuck with sort of static, things that are static, whether it's text or a photo or a video that sits in a player. And I think well, there's so much lost opportunity in all of the, the variety of things that we could be doing. Uh, um, and, and the bright spot I, do, I did see at the AP was around elections, creating dynamic content around elections and figuring out ways on how to sell that and how to create value so people would want to pay more for that. And that was pretty exciting. Definitely. And let's stay a little bit on the, the business off uh, side uh, of things and talk a little bit about how to make that business case. And by the way, for the participants who joined us later, please feel free to already send your questions. Ideally in the Q&A tool, we're going to spend the last 20 minutes uh, answering uh, these questions. We already have some, but please feel free to add some more. So Shazna, when you talk about, uh, we both agree completely on the, the importance of understanding the business side and making the business case and having that business perspective, even if you're an editorial or design decision maker or product decision maker. And a lot of what we teach here at the school in our executive program that we started last year is exactly that, trying to give managers and newsroom leaders the business and product understanding to make these cases. Can you share a little bit how you in practice do that? How do you, how do you make the business case for something that's sometimes not as easily tangible as saying, oh, 10,000 clicks, that translates into you know, that and that many ad dollars. How do you make that connection in your daily work? Well, I mean, I'll start with a non-business, non-obvious business term, and that is that my business is journalism. My business is news and information and, and delivering that to the public. Um, that's how we make money. And so um, we've done a lot of surveys. We've done a lot of uh, data work and found that our audience really wants to see information in different formats, and especially a younger and more tech-savvy audience. So pulling on that data, when I see some of these surveys, I, I grab those, those specific decks and I make sure that I present them at every opportunity I get when I'm, when I'm talking to at new orientation meetings, or when I'm talking to different departments, I always make sure I'm repeating data, internal data that we ourselves have collected about these different formats. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another thing is just, um, I think a lot of visual teams historically have been much more business minded, graphics especially, just because of its connection to product and technology. I would say the graphics departments historically have been the proto newsroom product teams because they very early on have had to uh, tie journalism in with user needs, technology, um, advertisers, sponsorships, uh, and so 
I, there's a history of that within visual teams. They've also historically been the smaller teams in ratio to the rest of the newsroom. Um, so there is a self-preservation mode that uh, people go into in justifying and having to find ways to justify why they're doing what they're doing. We don't have room for fat. We don't have room to do things just because it's fun. You know, we have to be really, really strategic when we make our decisions because we're smaller as well. So we're always going to be looking for ways to tie that back to data. But data has to be nuanced as well. It can't just be as about clicks, as you say. We're also helping ourselves. Like one thing I've always done um, in many of the teams I've worked in is, is try to, where there's an opportunity, switch up some of the positions to be more technology focused, data focused, so that we have that support, especially for us. Um, because some of these teams have also never had access to core infrastructure. CMSs are not made to do super interesting things. CMSs are made to plug in text, some photograph, and perhaps a video, and, and that content could be fantastic. But CMSs were not created for us to think in very exciting ways. And so a lot of visual teams have had to build their own templates historically. They've had to support their own technology. I think that's changing now. A lot of that's becoming more institutional. Um, but we've also had to negotiate with ad sales and ad tech on how we build those templates out and where that all fits. And so um, I think these groups have always been very that way minded anyway and having to justify what they do all the time and having to back that up with data. We've also, like, we've also taken on, we have a full, full understanding, a lot of uh, visual teams have been um, constrained by things like uh, off-platform uh, off technology such as Google AMP or Apple News. Um, uh, and we found ways around that. We found ways that we can build processes and tools so that our work doesn't get killed by these platforms. But we always have to work harder for the same thing as text and photos. Um, so I put a lot of priority around making sure we can reach all of our audiences and not sort of that old school way of, well, I only do it this way. And oh, you know, oh, well, it's going to get killed in AMP. It's going to get killed. It's not going to be as great on Apple. Let's make it great on Apple. Let's make it great on Google AMP because those are the two, those are two very powerful platforms. Definitely. And, and one thing that I saw, and I'd be curious to hear your view on, on how to approach this. One thing that I saw in many of my newsrooms is it's super hard. So as, as great as this shift to digital subscriptions and digital memberships and audience centric um, work is, it's sometimes super hard uh, to come up with the right set of metrics to actually translate what is success um, to a newsroom, an online newsroom that was used to just saying, oh, if it has more clicks, well, that's better. That's something that I, I know a lot of newsrooms uh, struggle with. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you approach that at the journal? Yeah, so I can talk about, well, two things. When I worked at Knight Foundation, obviously I had to assess a lot of projects. A lot of the projects we were funding, I had to assess the impact of that work. And some of the work is gonna be data and some of it's also gonna be qualitative. It's gonna be about what did we learn? We don't wanna not do things because we won't get an audience. Sometimes we want to do things intentionally because we want to try things. And so that was a great learning from my night years on um, just being very flexible about how you assess success. Shouldn't always be just about numbers, but numbers are very, very powerful, of course. Um, so we're in a really exciting phase at the journal where we've, you know, we've built out um, a really amazing digital newsroom uh, thanks to some of the hiring we've been doing through our strategy team and you know, looking at product and technology and their role much more closely in the newsroom. And um, I'm really excited because we just brought on a strategy editor that's going to be dedicated to visuals. And she's just came on board and um, I'm looking forward to working with her and we're going to formulate what we want to, how we want to define success through numbers, through data, both qualitative and quantitative. quantitative. I, I feel strongly about having both in that mix. So, um, on a day-to-day, -day, uh, without having formulated that yet, on a day-to-day -day level, um, there are a few things that sort of always catch my eye, uh, and you know, um, that might include uh, how long somebody's spending on a on a story, if they get to the end of the story, where they go next, if they come back the next day, if they come back the day after, how many days they come back to us in a month, in a week. 
um, looking at forms of habit um, as opposed to sort of anomalous spikes. Um, so those are some of the things that catch my eye right now. Uh, but I also think it's incredibly nuanced because there are so many different platforms. What, what, we have a partnership with Apple News and so it's really interesting to see the differences between what does really well on our own platform versus what does really well on Apple News. Apple News is a whole different audience. It's a much broader demographic, um, much, many more women um, actually in that demographic. And so uh, we have to look at the whole picture and be really, really nuanced on, about it, much more nuanced than we've ever been before. Great. Um, I'd love to move to some questions. We already have some audience questions and I'd uh, like to start with the one from HR Venkatesh who asks um, whether making this business case for visual journalism is easier for large organizations with deeper pockets. Well, it obvious, I, I think it obviously is, but he asks whether there are any replicable lessons for smaller organizations and whether the upfront investment in visual journalism uh, is worth it for smaller organizations. Well, first of all, it's going to depend on what audience uh, a small organization is trying to attract. I know that there are plenty of small local organizations who mostly want to um, target um, influencers in policy shaping and visual journalism might not be as important. So I think number one, it's important to know who your audience is. But number two, I, I have a really hard time believing that visual, like telling stories outside of a you know, hypothetically 900 word narrative is the, is going to satisfy, satisfy anybody at any moment. And so I think you can start small. I don't think you need a, a lot of people. Um, I, I think too that um, in my early days when there were just a few of us, um, it's really important to hire and to nurture people. If you can't find those people, bring them on and, and teach them to be dexterous, uh, to be able to do a few different things, um, not just, you know, I have the, you know, we, bigger organizations have the luxury of having great specialists in one area, such as 3D or, uh, you know, really complex data visualization, but to just figure out, uh, find people or make people or teach people how to be good at a couple of things. Because even if, if you're not doing visual journalism, you do have designers, you have designers in the team and why is that more you know they are intricately inter interconnected design and visual journalism so can some of those people cross over and try different things and i know for a fact that increasingly in our newsrooms our designers want to be more involved in the journalism i feel that journalists have had a great luxury a privilege of actually pull, pushing into the product side of things and i think it's not a bad thing to start inviting our colleagues in the newsroom who have different skills to be part of the journalistic process as well. I think, I think that's where we can make a lot of uh, progress with small teams. Thanks. Um, I'd move on to Thomas Seymath's uh, question about AR, VR and 360 video. To what extent do you see these immersive technologies as part of visual journalism and where do you think they could play a relevant role? Right. To be honest, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of, of that possibility, but it hasn't quite, you know, I, VR certainly has not, um, has not become accessible to all of us. Um, I went to a VR conference about 22 years ago in Amsterdam, I remember. And so the promise of VR and immersive has been with us for so long, but we haven't been able to deliver it. But I keep believing it's going to happen. I can't believe it's not going to happen. I can't believe that we're going to want to communicate in these squares. We're communicating <laughs> through these rectangles. I hope it's not this forever. <laughs> why are we settling for this? Um, look, it's, it's even hard for me to make a case to do much experimentation in VR because it's just not, it's just not there yet. But I do think it's important to be learning and trying, you know, maybe trying small experiments. AR obviously is a lot more accessible through our phones. Um, so I would say if, if, if this is about making a business case for this type of thing, you've either got to be in an organization who really believes in it and is going to go out all out on it, or you've got to sort of sneakily do some experiments on your own, which is what we, what we, what we try to do. We've done some really big projects, but you know, they've been like R and D more than anything. Mm. I actually, I think it, that builds on your uh, answer that you gave before where you said something that's just fun and just, you know, 
looking nice. It's learning. It's learning. You want it's to learning, learn. but it's not enough to kind of you know invest uh, a lot of time and energy and focus on, right? Yeah, I mean, like one example of um, of something we didn't have to do, but we did, and now it's going to affect everything. Is with uh, we've created processes and tools so that we can translate some of our more interactive work for Apple News specifically. And we've built it in a way that we've really sped up the process where we, how we can do that. And we found that some of these projects do very, very well on Apple News. Again, we're talking about the audience, very different. But what that has taught us now is like, maybe we should do more of our work like this on our normal platforms. Why are we only doing this when it like, why are we only doing this for this super sophisticated mobile audience? If everybody's mobile now, then we should be reverse engineering that, reverse engineering that and putting it back in to our core. So I do think one does learn things. One really, really does learn things that might not seem obvious, but then you might take back and integrate it into how you do things now. So, yeah. I'm all, I think you should just sneak things in. I, AR, you could, there's a lot of possibility there that you can do things for pretty cheaply and sneak them in at the end of your project and see what happens. I'd uh, like to move on to Yassim Ahmad's uh, question uh, about visual aesthetics and tone. And he says um, that this is so important for digital experiences popular with young audiences. What is your approach for a heritage brand like the Wall Street Journal and young audiences? Uh, at the Journal, um, we have, I think that generally we, we need to expand our vocabulary so that we can reach different our visual vocabulary um, visual styles so that we can reach and resonate with different people while keeping some some substance of the brand in there um you know i know a lot of i know there are a lot of places like uh, at the washington post where there's a lot of experimentation with the lily let's say and it's a completely different style and you know, I think maybe you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a good thing to test things out and see see what works. So I taught actually, this is a good story. I taught the first design for journalists class at CUNY, at the J School, and uh, it was really satisfying because it was um, teaching design to non-visual people who don't really have the that skill. And in a world where everybody's creating content, I do think it's increasingly important for everybody to understand what makes for good design and what makes for poor, poor choices. Because I do think when you're creating something, when you're designing something, you're also transferring a reputation. You know, design also can be translated into trust or mistrust. Consistency is part of a consistent design, a consistent voice, a consistent tone equals trust and not everybody can see it. Not everybody sees good quality necessarily. I, I, we can debate about this. I know, a lot of, I know it's a very controversial topic, but I do think if you do it a lot, you start seeing when something is done very professionally versus not. But not everything needs to be professional. Some, some things can be more of a guerrilla style, but you have to be really intentional. Actually, I think it's a super question because it gets into just so much. It gets into UI and UX and um, how you're conveying your brand, uh, your quality, your promise to a reader is through design. And so it's really important to, to get some, you know, train people up, train everybody up to understand it, even if they're not doing it on a daily basis. They're interacting with design all the time. Actually, Jeff's, Jeff Jarvis' question, question that he just asked is kind of building on that a little um, and he asked uh, given that the journal famously has no photos and was hardly visual in its history uh, he wonders whether there is any cultural lore origin story about the entry of visual journalism in the institution or is that ancient history well what I do know is that well there were always charts there were always great charts very 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 efficient Charts and the, the history of our stipples, um, the, the, the dot drawings that are done by our artists. Um, but a, an interesting story, and I, I, as I understand, our new CEO, um, Alma Latour, who became CEO a few weeks ago um, and has been at Dow Jones and was a journalist at the Wall Street Journal for a long time, um, 
he was behind bringing more photography into uh, into the journal's presence. And I think it's probably the web that drove that. It was probably the web that drove, probably drove the print product also becoming more visual. Um, so I'm really excited that Almar is now CEO. If he was the one who brought photography in, then that means, you know, a lot more promise for, for even more strong uh, visual journalism. So there have been visuals, they've been small. And I'll be honest, you know, I, I, I don't think historically people think of the journal and think, wow, lush, lush visuals. Um, but we've done a lot of great work in the last few years to really, you know, to bring in new formats that not, not everything needs to be a chart necessarily. You know, sometimes it, it can be a wonderful, like, 3D explainer of how the Boeing Max um, had all the had all its issues. Rather than doing that in ten charts, let's be more visceral about it and just show what happened. With with much, so we've been hiring a lot of um, specialists. As I said before, we you know it's you kind of need some people to be really good at some things and to bring them on to to reach the kind of quality that you want to be doing. Mm. Mm. So. Jeff, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, as I understand, our current CEO brought in photography, so I'm excited that he's, he's in that role. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, actually, Ariel Cyrulnik's question kind of, again, build, builds on, on, on these topics we've been talking about. For organizations that have this kind of text-first tradition, or at least had this text-first tradition, what are small habits they can adopt to begin incorporating visual journalists and visual yeah. considerations from the beginning? I think that's a great question. I think it's a really great question too. And um, what I find interesting, what it makes me think of is that visual teams have historically been the place where um, people come, people go to the visual teams when they want to do something that doesn't work in the CMS. And that includes text. That includes people who just want to format their text differently. They want to design it differently. Um, I think one very powerful tool in my experience has been um, sort of these mobile tap uh, tools, uh, formats. Julia talked a little bit about this in your last session, Anita, and we've built our own internal tools. And it's been really interesting to work with sort of narrative focused reporters on some of these projects because it's very difficult to think about one card, one idea per card, and you, you sort of progress through. And so what we did was we built out, um, just use Google, Google Slides, and said, here, we're going to edit this together in Google Slides. It's as if, it's as if you're going to present a slideshow. It's like, you have your image, we're going to put text here, but you only have room for this amount of text. And remember, you've got to tell the story in 10 of these slides, no, no more than that. And it was just so interesting to see how difficult that was. But we did it. We did some great projects that way. And so um, perhaps these sort of very compact mobile uh, mobile tap sort of formats are a really good entry point. Um, I found Google Tools actually to be really, really great uh, to co-edit with, um, with our reporters. So we find all different, like we did this beautiful Notre Dame piece um, not too long ago, it was mm. the 3D piece, and it showed how all the woes that um, rebuilding um, and renovating has had and we we're working with our colleagues in Paris and um, our director of graphics created this sort of slide deck where she she put little boxes and she said here fill this box in I know it seems rudimentary and but it's progress it's progress and it was a really really great collaboration so helping them by giving them tools and creating the constraints for them and really walking and sort of working closely with them that's been a success for us. And I feel a lot of these things and what you just mentioned and talked about um, are actually also mean that you need people, people like you, people like your teams in roles that are able to do this translation work and connection work and empathize, empathize with other parts of the organization. I do feel yep. that that is, that is also a story of, of translation and empathy that you're telling. It's true, and I've even started putting on job descriptions, you know, the ability to teach other reporters how to, you know, expand visual vocabulary and to become more visual. We've created internal processes as well so that reporters who aren't, who think they're not very visual, have access to certain people in the news, in the, in the visual team so that they can collaborate on an idea they have very early on. So we're trying to transfer learning with process change as well. 
I also find actually most people are more visual than they think they are. Um, whenever I see someone's hands moving when they're trying to explain something, that's already a sign that they already are seeing what, 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 what it could be. Another interesting thing too um, is that sometimes visual text is visual as well. And I, you know, one of my colleagues said this to me recently when I complained how everyone's coming to me for this thing, but it's, it's really text. It's, there's nothing visual about it. And she said, well, if you think about it, it's very visual because it's like a different way of laying the text out. And, and so that's another approach to getting reporters on board. Reporters who don't think they're visual is to think about what are different text formats. Even bullet, bullet points are a complete, used to be a mind blowing new thing. Um, but there's also a shape to it and a legibility to it and a scannability to it that is, um, that is visual, but it's text as well. If you think about the alphabet, it's visual. We learned how to read the alphabet, A, B, C, D. It, they're all shapes. And we learned how to understand those shapes. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, we're nearly at the end of, of our time, but I'd like to end with a question that was sent to me beforehand from someone who uh, just graduated J school and basically looked at your career. And one, one, of your, one of the amazing things about your career is that it's such a diverse career path, uh, but it still feels like there is a very, you know, very clear line um, of the things that you're excited about, but you had roles in product, roles in editorial, roles in philanthropy, roles that are somehow kind of a connection to the business side of things. How do you get there? That was the question <laughs> that this person asked me. How do, I, how do I start if I want my career to be like this? Well, I didn't plan it. So unfortunately, I'm not very, I won't have a great planning schema for you, but, um, I've never been afraid. I tend not to be afraid of, of risks. Um, like I started in tech. Um, I moved to Paris when I was 17 from London. I, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background. You know, I, I, I grew up in London. I grew up in the poorest borough of London from, you know, immigrant parents. Um, I felt that my way out and my way of changing my life from how my parents lives were was to work really hard and I worked really 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 hard if you look at the early part of my career I was hunkered down in one organization I was at the AP for quite a long time and I did two stints there I think it's really important when you're younger that you really get good at your craft I know that people want to jump quickly and they want to become managers and they want to get into all this other stuff but it's really really important to know what you're talking about because you've done it and you know what the pitfalls are you know what the pros are, you know what the cons are, you can call bullshit when something is not true. Um, so in those early days to just, you know, it's, it's really easy to jump around to see shiny objects. Um, I happened, it was all, <laughs> I happened to have a visa problem, which kept me at one place for a really, really long time at the time when I could have worked in so many different places, but I think it was a really good lesson. It really made me hunker down and get disciplined and not be distracted and just get very, very, um, have a deep understanding of what I was doing have a, and learn to be a journalist. I didn't go to journalism school. Um, I, I studied French and English literature, um, went and worked in tech um, and I learned to become a journalist on the job at the AP. So I had to earn my stripes. I had to stay there for a long time and build trust to show them that they could promote me into positions that maybe normally they wouldn't have given somebody like me in the past. So patience and hard work, it's, I guess, uh, very basic. No, but that's fantastic, fantastic advice, Shazna. And thanks for sharing that. And thanks for sharing so much. We are uh, at the end of our time here. Uh, that was our Let's Talk News Business conversation with Shazna Nessa, Global Head of Visuals at the Wall Street Journal. Thanks for joining us, Shazna. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks for everyone who was, uh, took part in this webinar and joined us for this conversation. Next week, uh, my colleague Jeff Jarvis is going to interview Richard Gingras, uh, the Vice President of News at Google, and they're going to talk about investing in local journalism after the pandemic. So please join us again next week uh, and have a nice day. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.